before we get started, I'd like to go over some guidelines for participating today. Um, you'll notice that everyone should be on mute by default, um, except for our presenters. And we ask that you participate through this session using the chat function. So you'll need to open the chat um, by clicking the chat icon on the bottom of your screen. And it should pop up on the right, or you might have to open the participants panel. Um, once you do that, um, you're free to type anything into the chat, any comments or helpful resources during the presentations or during the Q&A session. But we ask that, um, well, you should know that we won't be answering questions until after the presentations. Um, at that point, I'll be facilitating the Q&A using the raise hand function. So it's important that once you put a question into the Zoom group chat that you use um, the raise hand function in order to let me know that you have a question pending. And through that, I will then um, be passing along questions to our panelists. Before we get into the presentations, wanted to let everyone know about upcoming events we have at Sustainable Jersey. You can always find more information more information on our website. But on June 17th, we'll be having a Sustainable Energy Communities webinar, which will give a general overview of um, local initiatives, high impact initiatives to make your community sustainable, sorry, on the local level. And then on June 24th, we will have the Adding EVs to Your Municipal Fleet and Community webinar, um, which is similar to this, but this session, but with a wider scope covering telematics, um, EVs, fleet procurement, uh, and so on. And we'll be getting into some specific case studies of municipalities that have added electric vehicles to their fleet um, successfully. We also have some toolkit trainings that are coming up next week. We have a new energy efficiency outreach toolkits on and these trainings will help municipal staff and green team members kick off their own um, sessions, their own, sorry, energy efficiency outreach campaigns. You can register for those on our website. We also have a grant opportunity available or taking applications right now, the Sustainable Communities Grant Program for municipalities in the Atlantic City Electric Territory. And we're accepting applications for that on our website until July 16th. Just uh, for a quick reference for anyone interested in pursuing Sustainable Jersey certification this year, what we'll be talking about today is obviously most relevant to our alternative fuel vehicles actions, in particular the public EV charging infrastructure actions. So I highly recommend um, looking to those actions for resources following this session um, and certainly applying for those if you do end up pursuing the opportunities we'll be talking about today. Finally, giving a big shout out to our sponsors uh, for the municipal program and the schools program. They're the ones that make opportunities like this possible. And with that, I would like to pass on the mic to our first presenter, Mark Warner. Vice President of Gable Associates uh, and Charge EVC. Mark, take it away. Thank you, Hogan. Uh, and welcome, everybody. Um, you should be able to see um, my presentation now. <clears throat> um, thank you all for joining us. Um, this is a chance for Andrea and I to talk about one of our favorite subjects, uh, which is electric vehicles in New Jersey. Uh, things that we can all do to get as many people into their popular as possible. And then in particular, to talk about some funding that's becoming available, uh, that is available through a New Jersey DEP program uh, that's particularly relevant. Um, and um, as Hogan mentioned, uh, everything that we're going to be talking about on this call, and especially the funding that Andrea is going to be talking about, uh, will help you implement the um, EV actions, in particular the public charging actions. So let me, uh, my job here is to really provide some background 
um, to give everybody a, a little bit of a snapshot of uh, what's going on with electric vehicles in New Jersey. I will briefly overview uh, a recent EV law that was passed in New Jersey um, and then provide a little bit of background leading into Andrea's discussion uh, on the incentive program. Uh, so first thing is, uh, why are we even talking about this now? Uh, why now? And uh, the short answer is because uh, we now have a lot more practical choices for electric vehicles than we did even two years ago. Um, as the chart to the left show, we now have uh, over 15 battery electric vehicles from over 11 manufacturers, um, over 24 plug-in hybrid vehicles from 15 manufacturers, and many of those vehicles now offer over 200 miles of range. Um, they're priced for mainstream consumers, and a particular interest to what we're going to be talking about today, many of them allow fast charging, uh, and I'll be drilling down on exactly what that means in just a few minutes. So um, the bottom line is that EVs are no longer just a niche product, and they're no longer just a uh, plaything for the rich. Uh, there's something that um, many people, mainstream consumers, can seriously consider as a replacement for their um, gasoline-fueled vehicle. Um, and because of the changes that have happened in the industry and the availability of these products and, and then becoming much more affordable, we now have over 30,000 electric vehicles in New Jersey registered as of the end of 2019. Well, that progress is really good news because it turns out uh, the, the larger the fraction of, of driven miles in New Jersey that are electrified, the more people we get into EVs, um, there are a lot of benefits that result. Um, we did a very detailed study on what those benefits were. It was commissioned by Charge EVC. Uh, Charge EVC is a not-for-profit, stakeholder-based advocacy organization uh, that's focused on trying to help increase the use of electric vehicles in New Jersey uh, and the region. Um, we have a very diverse membership. We've got about 35 members uh, in that uh, program now. Uh, that includes both state and national environmental groups, um, the Clean Cars Coalition, uh, the vehicle retail organization, uh, uh, basically the dealers, um, the electric vehicle uh, manufacturers, uh, as well as all four uh, electric utilities in New Jersey, and a wide diverse range of uh, consumer and uh, equity advocacy groups as well. So we have a very broad and diverse set of stakeholders that have a common interest in electric vehicles. Um, and uh, they commissioned that we do a study to try and quantify what the benefits and costs would be of increasing electric vehicle use in New Jersey. That study was published in January of 2019. Uh, and there's three areas to focus. Um, one is that, and I'll sort of start at the bottom, um, electric vehicles significantly reduce air pollution, both in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, as well as other criteria pollutants that affect public health, like NOx, for example. And the general rule is that every electrically fueled mile is somewhere between 60 and 80% cleaner than a gasoline fueled mile, depending on exactly what methodology you use. So um, even when we do the net calculation, and look at uh, emissions going down at the tailpipe, but going up at the power plant, uh, we come out significantly ahead uh, cleaning the air uh, with electric vehicles, and that benefits everybody. Uh, the other benefit is for the EV owners themselves. In general, it costs about half as much to fuel an electric vehicle with electricity uh, than with an average car using gasoline. So all that savings adds up to literally billions of dollars worth of incremental disposable income circulating in New Jersey households that, uh, that they're saving on their fueling. The other one, the other benefit that's not as widely recognized is the more electric vehicles we have on the road, the more usage there is of our electrical distribution infrastructure, and that results in lower electricity rates for all ratepayers, not just the folks that are driving the EVs. Um, and this is a substantial benefit. Again, it translates to billions of dollars over time. And if you look at all of those factors across three different populations, uh, it's something like a net benefit of $11 billion through 2035. For those that are folks that are interested in the details on that, you can go to chargeevc.org, as noted at the bottom of this slide here, and you can uh, look at the detailed study. We are in the process of updating that study to also include not just the light duty vehicles, uh, but also medium and heavy duty diesel vehicles as well. Bottom line is the more people we get in, in EVs, uh, the more benefits we're going to realize for a lot of folks in New Jersey, saving money on fuel, 
saving money on electricity costs and cleaning the air for everybody. Uh, in recognition of those benefits, New Jersey has taken a very progressive stance uh, and signed into law um, a piece of legislation specifically intended to encourage electric vehicle adoption in New Jersey. It's one of the most aggressive uh, laws in the country. It was signed by Governor Murphy in January of this year. Uh, it does several things. First of all, it sets some uh, market leading vehicle adoption goals. Uh, the official goals of the state are 330,000 plug-in vehicles by the end of 2025, growing to over 2 million vehicles by 2035. Uh, and as part of helping to make that happen, it authorizes a $300 million vehicle purchase rebate program. It's one of the strongest in the country and um, the BPU is in the process of getting that program started. Uh, it also does some other things around um, uh, commissioning uh, goals for the medium and heavy duty segments by the end of the year, um, reinforcing the role of several of the state agencies to help realize these goals. Uh, and setting goals for state-specific uh, use of electric vehicles, as well as um, moving New Jersey transit buses to uh, zero emission. Uh, the other thing that it's done, which is uh, very unique and, and uh, one of the most uh, progressive stances in the country, is it also sets goals for charging infrastructure. Because everybody realizes that if we don't have places to charge these vehicles, then people won't use them. So it sets goals for at least 400 fast chargers at 200 locations in New Jersey. Uh, and it separates those out between corridor locations, which are fast chargers near major roads, as well as community locations close to near where we live and work. Uh, so the key thing here is that uh, the law recognizes that connection between uh, people adopting electric vehicles and being comfortable that there's enough charging in place, especially fast public charging, because the single biggest barrier for most folks is a concern that I get out on the road, my battery's running out, and there just aren't enough places to charge my vehicle. So um, we're going to focus on this. It's one of the key adoption barriers in New Jersey, uh, and it's the part of the market development problem that this new DEP incentive uh, helps tackle. So let me drill down on that just a little bit. Um, and set the stage for why this is such a strategic initiative, why it's so important. Um, so first of all, as many of you on this call know, most electric vehicle charging happens at home. People are going to charge their electric vehicle the same way they charge their cell phones. Um, and that typically represents somewhere between 5 and 5% of all charging is going to happen in that setting. Uh, and as a result, most people are going to leave their home in the morning with a full battery that's more than sufficient to get most people through most of their driving most of the time. Uh, however, uh, most drivers or prospective EV drivers know that, um, that even though they're charging at home most of the time, they may occasionally need to charge when they're out on the road. Um, and until they're comfortable that there are, in essence, the electric equivalent of a gas station, uh, they're not really comfortable buying an electric vehicle. That's called range anxiety. Uh, I think that's a misnomer. What they're really concerned about is charge anxiety. Uh, the vehicles today have more than enough range to meet most people's needs. What they're actually anxious about is whether on those rare cases when I have to drive further than the range of my vehicle will allow, whether there's enough of these charging stations around to, to meet their needs. Um, that recognition of the, the dominant role that charge anxiety, range anxiety plays it plays for getting people into electric vehicles is why that's now a strategic initiative for the state. Um, what we know is that these public chargers need to be widely available, they need to be convenient to use, and they need to be fast. Uh, we're not talking about the relatively slow level two chargers that you might use at home uh, and which typically take a couple of hours to add several, uh, significant range. We're talking about this new class of charger called DCFC, direct current fast chargers, uh, that can charge a typical battery to about 80% in 20 minutes or less. Um, so these DCFC chargers we think are really strategic because if we build out uh, enough geographic coverage of these fast chargers, make them conveniently available to everybody, uh, that will help get potential EV owners over their range anxiety and therefore we can get more people into cars faster uh, and that will help make the, the vehicle goals that the Stoic State has adopted uh, viable. So uh, what we're going to be talking about now for the rest of this presentation 
is really drilling down on public fast charging, uh, the role of municipalities in helping to make that happen, uh, and then the use of these DEP incentives in order to develop that infrastructure. So let me talk a little bit about what these applications look like. The picture there shows a, a real DC this would be off a turnpike uh, service area. Um, you can see these boxes are about the size of a refrigerator, a little bit smaller. Uh, they have two cables on them for the two different kinds of standards that uh, electric vehicle supports. Um, and uh, an EV would pull up to these, plug in the cable that works, and they in essence purchase the electricity from this machine. It's just like a vending machine or a dispensary for electricity. And what's unique about it and what's really uh, revolutionary in terms of making EVs more practical is that they can provide very high power charges. And so most people can get the quick charge that they need in 20 minutes or less. Um, so the question is, uh, how do these things get developed? Where should we cite them? What are the business arrangements that make them work? Um, so first of all, as you might expect, uh, the best projects are located in high traffic areas. Um, especially along major roads. And they're most preferred by users if they are um, near amenities, if they can, while their vehicle is charging, they can use the restroom, they can grab a cup of coffee, um, those sorts of things. Um, and clearly they need to be easily accessible. Um, there's a wide variety of potential hosting sites. Um, retail locations, malls and restaurants are very popular. Restaurants, uh, rest stops and service areas where they exist off major roads. Um, we also see CDs being installed in public parking areas uh, and including a variety of locations that uh, could be hosted by municipal and county sites. So for example, at libraries or in public municipal lots and so on, or in, in uh, municipal controlled parks. There are a variety of business models and partnership structures involved. Uh, usually there is a site host, uh, somebody that has control of a piece of property that meets these criteria, uh, and that would like to sponsor the hosting of one of these facilities. Uh, and then whether they do it themselves or they under contract allow a third party entity to then own and operate that charger, uh, you're in essence providing a public service for fast charging. Um, and uh, as I noted, there are more than we can get to on this call. There are a lot of different business structures involved, uh, but in the case of municipal facilities, uh, typically what's being done there is either municipality is buying and owning and operating get charging infrastructure uh, and this incentive program that Andrew is going to talk about would help you do that and you can charge for delivering those services uh, or you would be a hosting site and you would find a third party provider to make that investment and then own and operate the facilities and pay you for the use of that spot. Now as I mentioned the law distinguishes between two different kinds of chargers those that are along major roads, which we call corridor chargers, and those which are more at a community level intended for local drivers. Uh, we're going to be focusing on the corridor applications, and the law requires at least 75 locations, um, but it's worth knowing uh, for those municipalities, participants on this call, even if you're not ideally suited for a corridor application, uh, community projects are needed as well, and there will be uh, likely some subsequent programs that uh, will help get those community level projects done as well. Uh, but for the rest of this call, we're gonna be focusing on corridor applications designed to serve traffic on heavy roads. So let's talk a little bit about what the potential role of the municipality is in this. Uh, first of all, they could serve as a site host. Uh, municipalities frequently control a variety of uh, properties, um, including parking spaces or areas uh, that could be used to host one of these charging facilities. Uh, they could, even if they don't have properties themselves, uh, I've worked with several municipalities that uh, obviously have relationships with the business community in their town, and they're working with those um, private folks, whether it's commercial entities or retail locations, uh, and encouraging them to step up as site hopes. Uh, and there are often economic development um, implications of that. For example, putting fast charging into a um, downtown retail center in order to attract traffic to the town. Uh, municipalities can also help facilitate these installations, regardless of who's doing it in terms of siting and permitting. Um, and there are important details related to expanding community awareness about the availability of these facilities in the town. 
So it's worth noting that you know these are significant uh, capital projects, um, but for the municipalities in particular, this new DEP incentive program will cover most, if not all, of the capital investment. So uh, in many cases, you can implement these projects uh, with little out-of-pocket investment. Um, and then there are fees that you can collect for the use of the equipment every time uh, a driver makes use of it. Um, so as I noted at the very beginning, um, hosting or developing one of these public charging projects uh, it's a really high impact for communities that are trying to reduce their greenhouse gas footprint, uh, that are trying to encourage cleaner air and the reduction of criteria pollutants in their communities. Encouraging EV uh, electric vehicle use is one of the most impactful things you can do. Um, and one of the highest impact ways to encourage EV use is to help people um, find the public chargers that are available. And if it works out, to host one in your town and make them conveniently available for your residents. So there's a whole action in the Sustainable Jersey program specifically to support that. Um, and it's worth 15 points and also counts towards gold certification. So keep in mind that the incentives that Andrea is gonna review are, uh, would specifically help you implement the action uh, associated with public charging. So in the case of municipalities, uh, you know, timing matters. Uh, there are some process uh, requirements involved. This is a capital development project uh, in many cases. Um, the deadline for the application for the DEP incentive is the second, uh, which is you know only several weeks away. Um, obviously, municipalities could develop this if they're going to you know host it or even own it themselves. You could develop it through an RFP process if you can manage to get that done in the short time allowed. Um, or uh, it's also worth knowing that for those of you that are part of an aggregate buying group, uh, one example of which is SourceWell. Uh, there are equipment providers in those aggregation programs uh, that can help you get access to the equipment that we're talking about. In the case of SourceWell, uh, I've been able to confirm that there are vendors there that provide the DCFC equipment uh, that meet the eligibility requirements for the DEP program. They also provide the networking software and the billing services needed to make public charging work. Um, and there are vendors there that can provide the installation as well. Uh, or you could work with some of your uh, existing uh, elect electrical contractors as well. Um, so the choice is yours. If you can move quickly enough, you could work through a typical RFP process, um, or in the interest of time, uh, you could exercise your options under an aggregation group like SourceWell uh, that we know does have the vendors involved that can help make the solution work. Uh, for those of you that might have some quick questions, I'd be happy to help point you in the right direction to try and get a project like this organized. Uh, you can reach me best through email, uh, mark at gableassociates.com. So please feel free to reach out and I'll help in any way that I can. Uh, so with that, um, as an introduction, uh, let me hand it over to Andrea, the main event now, and you can hear about uh, the incentives that are available to help make this happen. And we'll take questions on anything that I just discussed, uh, as Hogan said at the very end. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Hogan and Sustainable Jersey for hosting today. Let me take a moment to pull up my screen. Okay, I'm Andrea Friedman. I work at the Department of Environmental Protection in the Electric Vehicles Group. And I'm always pleased uh, when I'm able to talk about programs where we're giving away money. On Earth Day in April, we announced that we were making $45 million available for grants for electric vehicles and electric vehicle, vehicle charging infrastructure. The deadline to apply, as Mark said, is June 22nd. So uh, we're doing another round of publicity to get the word out about these programs. This is the final solicitation for the Volkswagen settlement. Many of you, if you're here from local governments, are uh, familiar with that grant program. We did one solicitation where we gave away millions of dollars. This is the final solicitation, the final bite of the apple at this pot of money. There are three categories of eligible projects, and I'll talk about all three. Uh, the first category is electric vehicle charging stations, and our priority is the public fast charging stations that Mark talked about in 
his presentation. I'm going to spend most of my presentation talking about that program. It's a new program, so I'm going to talk about eligibility and process. The second category is heavy duty electric vehicles and equipment. For example, um, electric trucks, electric dump trucks, electric school buses and transit buses. Our priority for those projects is environmental justice communities. Those are low to moderate income communities that have been overburdened by air pollution and other types of pollution. And our third category of programs are electric shared mobility pro programs like car share and ride hailing. And again, our priority for those projects is environmental justice communities. The grants for electric vehicle charging stations will be run through our existing program, which is called It Pays to Plug In. The new part of that program are grants for public direct current fast chargers. These are high powered fast chargers along major roadways. The maximum grant is up to $200,000 per location. The ongoing part of that program, the part that many of you are familiar with already, is up to $4,000 per port for level two chargers and up to $750 per port for level one chargers. And these are eligible anywhere, basically anywhere except a residential home. So public places, workplaces, and that includes uh, chargers for employees who drive their own vehicles to work or, and or charging for fleet vehicles. Uh, multifamily homes like apartments and condominiums and uh, chargers for shared mobility projects. The DC fast chargers will be funded through a competitive solicitation. The application deadline is June 22nd. So on June 23rd, we will look at all of the applications that came in and we will rank them based on some ranking criteria that I'll discuss shortly. The applications for level one and level two charges are first come first served rolling basis. So we have a pot of money set aside for those. Right now it's about $150,000. You can submit applications for those now and we will start, uh, start working on those applications immediately and fund them until that pot of money runs out. But the fast chargers is a competitive solicitation deadline June 22nd. So now I'm gonna talk about the new public fast charger incentive. I will talk about eligibility, selection criteria, reimbursement amounts, and a little bit of process. So the eligible locations are major travel corridors, major roadways. We have a list. I will show you the link to that list uh, at the end of the presentation. So these are toll roads, interstates, U.S. highways, and New Jersey state highway, New Jersey state highways. These are the big ones that carry the majority of traffic in New Jersey. The site must be located within one mile driving distance from an exit or intersection along those highways. And there must be no existing DC fast charger stations at that site. So I'll talk a little about the requirements. These are eligible projects. You must install at least two fast charging stations at that location. You can install more, but we will only subsidize two. These are high powered fast chargers, minimum 150 kilowatts per charging station, and they can't be power shared. If there are two charging stations and two cars charging at the same time, both of the cars must be able to charge at 150 kilowatts. These chargers must be available exclusively to the general public. So it's like a public gas station. Um, they don't have to be at sites like gas stations. They can be at places like a town center or a big box store, but they have to be available exclusively to the general public. So if you're a company and you have a, a fast charging station that you use to charge your fleet vehicles, but you allow the public to use it 
at other on other hours, that will not qualify. It has to be open exclusively to the public 24 seven and it has to be user friendly. So well lit open 24 seven accept credit cards. It can accept other forms of payment as well, but it must at least accept credit cards. It has to display pricing information. And each charging station must have a CCS connector and a Chatamo connector. And uh, that's a little bit technical, but it's important. Uh, the automakers have not agreed on a common plug. So if you have an iPhone and your roommate has an Android phone, you can't charge the iPhone with the Android charging cable and vice versa. Only the iPhone can be charged with an iPhone cable. Only the Android can be charged with the Android cable. It's similar with cars. Some electric cars use a CCS plug. Some cars use a Chatmo plug and Tesla's use Tesla. We want to make sure that anyone who drives an electric car that pulls up to these stations can charge at that station. And that means each charging station has to have a CCS connector and a Chatmo connector. Tesla cars can, uh, Tesla owners can buy an adapter that will allow them to use those connectors. So anyone who drives up to one of these charging stations must be able to use it. It's universal, it's required in the legislation, and that's why we're requiring it in our grant program. Um, sometimes these are called dual standard. So now I'm gonna call about, talk about selection criteria. So everything just I talked about are requirements. So the question is, if we, were, if we receive more applications than we can fund, how will we rank them? How will we prioritize them? We have developed something called the DC Fast Charging Suitability Score. I will show you a map in a moment. The score applies to each exit or intersection along those eligible highways. And what goes into the score are proximity to amenities, meaning restaurants, retail, et cetera. And that's because most people who charge will be there for 10 or 20 minutes or maybe 30. So we want them to be able to have bathrooms or go get, grab a cup of coffee. Uh, also going into the score are the traffic volume. Is it, uh, is it a busy highway or is it a very quiet highway? And population density. So what we're looking for is the highest priority are those places where there are a lot of people and a lot of traffic, a lot of people who um, are likely to be able to use that charger. And it's within walking distance of a cup of coffee or somewhere to pop in and, uh, and do a quick purchase. The law requires that they be at least 25 miles apart. So we will be looking for distance and we will look to fill coverage gaps, charging deserts, places where there are no chargers nearby, no fast chargers nearby. So I mentioned, a, I mentioned a map. So this map shows existing and planned DC fast charger locations that meet the criteria of the grant program and they meet the criteria of the grant program because they meet the criteria of the law. So the green stars are fast charging stations that are up and running and meet the criteria. The yellow stars are planned stations that are far enough along that they are, we are confident that they will be completed. So you can see there aren't very many of them. There are fast charging stations all over the state, but they're not dual standard, or they're uh, lower power, or they're not open 24 seven, for example. This map also shows the 25 mile buffer. So the pink is 25 miles from these uh, existing and the light blue is 25 miles from the planned DC fast chargers. The map also shows small circles, small colored circles along these eligible highways, and those indicate the suitability scores. Um, the darker green, the higher the score. So I am going to go to the next slide, which will zoom in to this section of the state right here so you can get a better look at that. Okay, this is a DC fast charging location that meets our criteria. This is the 25 mile buffer. And the circles are the suitability scores for exits and interstations. The darkest green have the highest suitability scores. 
uh, later in the presentation, I'll give a link to this map and we will have uh, an interactive GIS map up shortly. So now I'll talk about reimbursement amounts and uh, what count as eligible costs. So the maximum grant is $200,000 per site. That's the cap. If the site is government owned property, we will reimburse 100% up to that maximum of $200,000. If it's on private property, we'll pay 80% of eligible costs up to the $200,000 maximum. So eligible costs are pretty liberal. Uh, liberal Purchase of the charging stations, installation, maintenance agreement of up to five years, and the network subscription of up to five years. So this is the process. You must meet public procurement requirements. Uh, local governments are familiar with this. This means that uh, you have to get three quotes. You have to show us that you have gotten three quotes. If you have questions about how to do that, you can shoot us an email and we'll answer that. DEP must approve your application and sign a grant agreement with you before you spend any money. Don't buy any charging stations. Don't start installation until we have sent you an email that says you're approved and until you have signed a grant agreement with us. Once you sign a grant agreement, the clock starts and you have 12 months to install for DC fast chargers or nine months to install for level one or level two chargers. You'll receive reimbursement after the installation is complete and you send us invoices and some other paperwork. So important to keep in mind you have to be approved and sign a grant agreement before you spend any money. And this is a reimbursement grant. You don't get the money up front, you get the money at the end. For details and application materials, you, this is, uh, it pays to plug in, which is our grant program. Uh, maps, a, a spreadsheet of eligible roadways, and a spreadsheet of the suitability scores for each exit intersection are here. If you have questions, you can send them to uh, our grant program, drivegreen at dep.nj.gov, or you can send them directly to me and I will forward them to the right people. So that was the charging stations. There are two more eligible categories. I'll touch on them briefly. Um, one is, well, let me go back. So for the charging stations, we've allotted 7.6 million. Most of that will be for public fast chargers. We've allotted 37.2 million for electric heavy duty vehicles and equipment in environmental justice communities. These are diesel replacements only. You can't buy a new electric truck unless you uh, retire and get rid of a comparable diesel. So we want to take the old dirty diesels off the road and replace them with clean electric. So examples of the kinds of uh, vehicles that are eligible are school buses, garbage trucks, delivery trucks, transit buses, um, port equipment, uh, airport ground, ground support equipment. And again, these are all diesel vehicles and equipment to be replaced with electric equivalents. And then the third category is electric shared mobility projects. Those are things like electric car share and electric ride hailing and electric taxis in environmental justice communities. And the reason that we're funding these is because it's important to, my, important to us that everybody benefit from the revolution in transportation that will get rid of fossil fuel transportation and be replaced by electric transportation. And it, we are devoting a significant amount of money to projects in low and moderate income communities where people can't afford to buy electric cars. So details and applications for these are at this link. Um, I believe you will have access to this PowerPoint, uh, both of our PowerPoints after the webinar. For more information about the grants and also about the basics of electric vehicles and charging, how to choose an EV, how to find charging stations, uh, maps and data are at uh, DEP's EV website, Drive Green New Jersey. And we encourage you to follow us on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. 
please feel free to reach out to me um, if I can't answer your question and we'll pass it on to the people who do. And that is all that I have. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I believe Hogan is going to read some of the questions that have been submitted via chat. So thank you very much. I'm looking forward to seeing your applications. Hogan, thank it's all you. yours. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Um, yes, we do have a handful of questions so far, so I'll just start going down the list. We have a question about um, nominating sites for fast charging. Is that allowed or is that possible anywhere? No, we're not accepting nominations. We're accepting applications either from site hosts who want to develop at a particular site or from the site host, like a municipality that wants to develop at a site. We won't accept, we will not accept nominations unless there is a proposed project along with it. Great. We had another question, which I think is just clarifying um, what you just covered with regard to level two charging incentives are those only limited to environmental justice communities? No, level one and level two chargers can be cited anywhere. The only thing that's not eligible is um, single family residential homes. That's a good question, thank you for that. Great. Next, um, a question about DC stations. Is there a requirement to make an informational post near the exit off of the main road to make drivers aware of an installation? It's not required, but we strongly encourage it. We do require that you register your charging station at one of the central databases that gets you on all of the maps. So we have more guidance on this on, uh, in the application materials. So there's a federal website where you can register. Um, there are a number of apps where you can register and they all, they pull from all of the websites. So we, we require you to be posted and registered on a website so that when anyone is looking on the web or on an app for a fast charger, they will find that fast charger. We're not requiring physical directional signs, but we would be very happy if you build them into your charger. There has to be a sign, for example, for level one and level two chargers, there has to be a sign at the parking spot that says electric vehicles only or electric vehicle charges only, but we're not requiring directional signs off of the site. Great to know. All right, uh, a question about the requirement to get multiple quotes for public pr procurement, does that only apply to government property? It also applies to public property. So uh, if you're a Starbucks and you want charges on your site, you have to show that you have gotten three quotes for companies from whom to buy charging stations for, uh, for your Starbucks. So Andrea, if I could just expand on that, anybody yes. applying for the program needs to provide three quotes, whether you're public or private, right? That's correct. Great. Um, another question, what, or sorry, can you apply for both the charging stations and the vehicles themselves? It's like if you're trying to replace diesel garbage trucks. Yes, if you are applying for funds to replace a diesel truck, you can you you include the cost of the charging station and charging infrastructure in your proposal, and we will reimburse for all of those costs. So you don't have to apply in one place for the vehicle and then go to a place to plug in for the charging station. You apply for funds for the vehicle and the charging equipment in the same proposal, and uh, both of those are eligible costs. So Andrea, could somebody, uh, in essence, do two separate projects, one to do public DCFC and apply to that program for the public DCFC, and then have a separate application for a diesel displacement? 
Yes, absolutely. Great. Um, we have one other small question about grant opportunities for electric low speed vehicles. Is that, uh, is there any program available for that? Uh, if you're talking about, um, I can't remember what they're called. If you're talking about the kinds of cars that people use to tool around the shore or uh, uh, like on campuses or things like that, no, those are not eligible. Um, for the Volkswagen funds, the vehicles are uh, ranked by weight. So if you need, if you want to know whether your vehicle is eligible or not, you go onto our Volkswagen uh, website and look at the classes of eligible vehicles that list the weight. So the low speed light vehicles are not eligible. Now I think there is some airport ground source, uh, airport ground support equipment that might be classified as the, the lightweight vehicles, uh, like the vehicles that are driven around to move luggage around. Um, so those, are, those will be described in the Volkswagen materials about whether they're eligible or not. But, but the ones that are like um, sort of fancy golf carts, golf carts, they're not eligible. Right. Um, one last, oh, a couple more questions, I guess. One clarifying for the three quotes requirement, do you still need three quotes if you're using SourceWell? I believe that I believe that um, that Sourcewell will qualify, and you don't have to get the three quotes. I'm not positive, and I'm going to check with our fiscal people. So please shoot me an email, and we'll get that answered, and we'll also put it in the FAQs to answer it for everybody. And, and just so everyone understands, the reason we think that's the answer is because in order to get onto the Sourcewell list, you have to go through a competitive process. Uh, so you're in essence leveraging the competitive process of the aggregate buying pool uh, by virtue of using one of the vendors on that list. Right. I'm almost positive the answer is if you use SourceWell or the Climate Mayor's uh, EV Collaborative, you don't have to get three quotes. But I, I, I don't want to say that for sure without checking back. So please shoot me an email. I will answer and I'll get it in our frequently answered questions. Right, we've got just one more. How many vehicles can an applicant apply for? I guess this would be a regard to that the heavy duty. Yeah, there's no limit on that. If you have a lot of projects, uh, go ahead and submit them. And um, there are, um, rank, there's ranking criteria for the vehicle projects. Um, I didn't talk about the, that on, on this email, but um, uh, if you have any questions about whether any of your projects would qualify or would like or would likely be ranked high, shoot an email to me or to the to the Volkswagen website email address and um, and you'll get an answer. And we're happy to talk to anybody about a project that you're thinking about before you submit the application. So just reach out to us. We can uh, you know have a chat over the phone. Um, it might be a, a good thing to do to to know if you have if you um, you know, your project has a good chance or not, we'll save you the work if your project doesn't have a good chance. Or if you have questions about what's eligible or not, we're more than happy to talk to you by email or by phone. Great, okay. Um, that covers all the questions that I have seen. I good. apologize if I missed any ones, but as we've said, um, feel free to contact any of us with follow-up questions. Um, and there will be a recording of this webinar for you to, to share with anyone who you know missed it and would love to hear what we've been talking about. But really, that if you're thinking about applying for the program, keep in mind that the deadline's coming up and we really hope that this has helped you figure out the details that you needed um, to put together an application. Mark, Andrew, do you have anything else to share? No, Great. call us. Yeah. <laughs> call us, email us, send your applications in. We want to give we want to give you money to do good projects. Just building on that as a closing comment, uh, at the risk of stating the obvious, this really is an extraordinary opportunity. This is a very large grant. 
that will fund the majority of costs uh, for anybody, but including municipalities uh, to help build out this public fast charging infrastructure, which we know is one of the biggest and most high impact things that you could do to really help encourage EV adoption. So this is really an extraordinary opportunity. And uh, even if you can't do it within your own towns, uh, help get the word out. Um, uh, I'm hoping that we can flood the DEP with more applications they know what to do with. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. All right. And uh, just as a reminder, if anyone has any questions about how this applies to Sustainable Jersey or you want guidance on something like the co-ops that are available for purchasing, um, check out our public alternative fuel vehicle action on our website. Um, but lots of great resources. Hope to be seeing at lots of applications from all of you. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.